1935, the Hitler youth were growing up in Germany. A new air force was being built for this new generation. The future pilots of the Luftwaffe were taught a new concept of war. the Luftwaffe had 2,000 planes and 20,000 men. Soon, many of us who watched would be training to join them. We weren't thinking like that in Britain. We only watched and began to understand we were no longer an island and must build new defences in the sky. At headquarters, Air Defence of Great Britain, we held a series of meetings to discuss the new dangers. Ideas and the paper to write them down on were our only effective equipment. Well, gentlemen, we have three main requirements. And the first is an entirely new fighter, the type that Mitchell and Cam are designing. The air staff want a 300 mile an hour job with eight guns in the wings. As you know, we've been thinking around this problem for some time. And without any doubt, it means leaving the biplane, which we know so well, and going to the monoplane with heavier armament, and many new features such as close cockpit, retractable undercarriage, higher wing loading, and of course, new structural problems. They called her the Hurricane in the end. Her basic design never changed, and we put her into production with a few modifications. All metal wings, variable pitch air screw, and the new Merlin engine. We developed the Merlin from the Schneider Trophy engine, the last engine Sir Henry Royston before he died. Most of the Battle of Britain fighters were fired by the Merlin. It gave the Hurricane a top speed of 330 miles an hour and the Spitfire rather more. The Spit came into service a year after the hurry. She was Britain's first all-metal fighter and the fastest warplane yet. On the 5th of March 1936, Mud Summers made the first flight and we heard a new sound in the sky. we need is an early warning system so that we can send our fighters to intercept at the right place and the right time. Sound detectors are too short a range and the death rays out, isn't it? I'm afraid so, but it has led us to a new technique developed by Watson Watt. I promised that we could set up an invisible, unclimbable radio fence off our shoreline through which no enemy aircraft could pass without our obtaining its exact position. I can now report that my guarantee of 60 miles has been fulfilled and that my recent hope for 200 mile range on the high flyer is justified. We called it RDF, Radio Direction Finding. Later we rechristened it Radar. Mysterious towers appeared around our coast. 11 in 1937, 160 by 1939. In 
darkened rooms, a 24-hour watch began, which was to end only with the defeat of Germany. On this lay the whole plan of our air defence, and our fighter control system was built upon it. Our new horizon was a pale line across a cathode ray tube. It's all very hush-hush, but we've got five RDF stations covering the Thames estuary. Bordsey, Bromley, Canudon, Dunkirk and Dover. Any airplanes coming towards our coast will be picked up by one or more of these stations who can tell whether they're friend or foe. They report their positions back to London. In spite of all this, some bombers will get through. So our third requirement is an adequate ground defence, gun balloons. The uh, modern threat is, of course, the bomber, and the most deadly method is dive bombing. That is, pointing the airplane at the objective and diving pull out at it. Bombs are released at the crucial moment, just before he must flatten out for his climb. Means used to prevent this dive bombing are, of course, your balloons. Good morning. Good morning. I'm from the balloon barrage of the Royal Air Force. We would like to put a balloon in your back garden. A balloon? Wally, here's a man who wants to put a balloon in the back garden. Suppose we'll get a wee bit of compensation for this. Such were the weapons in which we put our hopes, and these the men. Pilots, navigators, ground crew, pilots, air gunners, pilots, wireless operators, pilots, pilots. For the Royal Air Force, for the Fleet Air Arm. Right, Robinson, I want you to go right through the starting up drill. Plug in RT. Put RT to receive. Switch on undercarriage lights. Put petrol on reserve. And while these flew their erratic way to skill, four men met in Munich. And one came home to London. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Chamberlain did not speak for the Luftwaffe. For us, it was not the time for peace. On the first day of September 1939, we flew against Poland. Radio calling London. Warsaw Radio. We silenced the Poles in four weeks. Against our will, they had only courage. Against our tanks, cavalry, against our aircraft, rifles. Their allies, France and Britain, were powerless at the other end of Europe. September the 3rd, 1939. This is London. The following official communique has been issued from 10 Downing Street. On September the 1st, His Majesty's Ambassador in Berlin was instructed to inform the German government that unless they were prepared to give His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom satisfactory assurances that the German government had suspended all aggressive action against Poland, 
and were prepared promptly to withdraw their forces from Poultry, His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom would, without hesitation, fulfill their obligations to Poland. That is the end of the announcement. Please stand by for a few moments. On your toes, chaps. The O.C. is coming in. What's it done? Well, it started. Attention, everybody. It has just been announced by the Prime Minister that as from 1100 hours today, that's just three minutes ago, we are at war with Germany. From now on, anything may happen. We were dead keen that morning. So dead keen, we misplotted a fighter at one of our RDF stations and reported it as an unidentified aircraft approaching over the channel. Good practice, I suppose, for all concerned. X-ray 1, West, Sugar 1187, Sugar 1187, 3 at 1, 0. But the bombing war had not yet started. Our few bomber squadrons were being built up to attack the enemy's forces, not his towns. In spite of Warsaw, we still hope to avoid total war. Our new Wellingtons were used to drop leaflets over Germany and to support our troops in France. We sent an advance air striking force at once to bases in France. Not a very powerful one. Some Blenheims, Battles, Wellingtons, Hurricanes and Lysanders. We called up the auxiliaries and sent ground crews across the channel with the BEF. which we could build our strength and plan our future through the months the Americans called the Phony War. that first winter, the sky was still. The war went underground. The Maginot Line, they said, was stronger than the Siegfried. It was the whole trench system of the Kaiser War frozen into concrete. And the mines behind it frozen too. On a pas pas, they said again.
It all had the stale, familiar smell of 1914. We took the left of the line, the north. We mucked about on the Belgian border, killing time. There was nothing else we could do. The Belgians wouldn't let us in. We were infantry mostly, a few tanks, some artillery, and the RAF, of course. They built some airfields and put a couple of dozen squadrons there. Pretty old stuff, some of them. We wondered if Hitler had something better up his sleeve. And early in April, he began to find out. Here is the first news for today, Tuesday, April the 9th. The High Command of the German Army announces that in order to counteract the actions against Denmark and Norway and to prevent a possible hostile attack against these countries, the German Army has taken them under its protection. Strong forces of the German Army have therefore invaded these countries this morning. We came not only by sea, but by air also. First we took the airfields, then our Junkers transports brought in men and supplies until all Norway was ours. And that was only the start of it.